Hello, I'm George Schilling and this is my studio, Bank Cottage, and I just wanted to do a little follow-up to the drum recording video that's on recordproduction.com, which we recorded at Modern World um, more than three years ago now. So, uh, as evidence to the, the old cliché that uh, you're forever learning and changing what you do, I thought I'd show you some of the changes that I've made to the way I record drums since then. So while we're around this side of the drum kit, I'll just show you the, the kick drum, which is um, my, my new exciting Yamaha Recording Custom Kit included a 24-inch bass drum, and that's rather larger than, than most kits that I've recorded in recent years. Um, a lot of bass drums, when we've hired a kit previously, it's been a 22-inch or a 20-inch. And I just thought that would kind of give us a bit more of a, a John Bonham sort of sound. And, it, and it's worked really well so far. It, that bigger, beefier sound has meant that I haven't so far needed to take the front head off. Um, which is a good trick to do if you haven't quite got enough of the weight hitting the ambient mics and getting out into the room. Sometimes I'll set a kit up like this and mic it at the hole like that. Um, and just, just decide that maybe it could do with a bit of extra something and then we unscrew the front head and take it off and it just allows the air to flow out a bit better and give you that bigger sound. Um, I'm still using the Bayer M88 TG that I mentioned in the previous video um, and the thing to do with this is to have it about level with the hole of the bass drum to give you a nice balance between the, the click and the, the boom and moving it further in will give you more of the more of the click and pulling it out again will give you more of the boom um, in the room so uh, that was that was a mic that I started using not long after I did a session at Psalm East with Gavin Harrison of Porcupine Tree, fantastic drummer, who uh, turned up and thrust one of those into my hand and said, "Yeah, mate, try that." So I did, and I, I thought he was right. It sounded really good. So um, I've uh, managed to acquire one and still been using that ever since. And it means that you just need one mic most of the time, which saves any kind of phase issues or any problems like that. I think in the last video I've mentioned that I don't often do stereo ambient miking. Well, since then I do. <laughs> I've kind of had a change of heart and um, I've got a nice pair of 87s, so I've got some dead posh mics and pointing them at the floor in the, I think if you go onto the recordproduction.com website there's the video of Clint Murphy explaining that where he has a pair of 414s pointing at the floor. I put them very close together. In fact, I get them as close as I can without touching. And they really are only a couple of inches off the floor. And I've got them pointing away from each other in a sort of XY formation, which means you get super um, phase coherence. So there's no kind of cancelling of frequencies or comb filtering or anything like that. And um, I, ha I have them quite near the bass drum, so they, they get a lot of that bass drum ambience and give you that extra weight, which you kind of need to make the most of in a small room where there's not the room for the air to get around so much. Um, so yeah, they're just very close to the floor, very close to each other. And I still compress them an awful lot as well. Stick them through my Empirical Labs fat so usually on a fairly fast setting, um, which I think Romesh Dodangoda mentioned that he does the same thing sometimes. Um, so that's a, that's a favorite technique with being fairly brave with the, with the compression. And always checking your phases, of course, against the other mics of the kit and making sure that you're getting the most bottom end that you can. So also while we're around this side of the kit, I can show you the overhead miking that I've got going on here. Um, these are ribbon mics. The oh, smash. These are a pair of uh, Bayer Dynamic M160s. And I quite like using ribbons on overheads. Um, I've sometimes also had a lot of success using Coles 4038s, which are big heavy things, and they're figure of eight compared to where these are hypercardioid, so these are much more directional. Um, but in here, the 4038s work really well because they give you a little bit more air and ambience and a, a lot of weight, and they just sound superb. And you can get quite a lot of the sound of the kit just from the overheads using the 4038s. Um, but otherwise, these are, these are very nice mics, and I think the thing with ribbon mics, it's, it's a funny thing, isn't it? You, you use slightly duller sounding mics for brighter cymbals uh, to try and tame them a bit. And, and when I bought my cymbals to go with the kit, I've got the sort of dark Sabians. Because if you get a drummer that's smashing the hell out of the, the kit, uh, the cymbals can very quickly dominate things, and especially if you want to use ambient mics and a bit of the room. Um, there is a danger of it becoming too bright and splashy and it just makes it difficult to mix really if that's kind of getting in the way of the vocals and stopping you getting a good ambient and bright snare drum and tom-tom sound. 
So I've gone for dark Sabians for the for the symbols I've got. This is a very simple setup with just a ride and a crash at the moment and the, the dark hi hats. Um, and then on the tom toms, I've also had a bit of a change of heart. Um, in that, uh, I think in the previous video I mentioned that I would often use 57s or 421s, the Shures or Sennheisers, uh, which are both very good dynamic mics. And um, I've actually tending now more to use the um, 414s, which are rather smarter condenser mics. Um, so you obviously got to have confidence that the drummer's not going to bash them because it's been an expensive accident. Um, but also you probably need to think they look like they're quite a long way from the drum and that's a deliberate thing as well because if you've got a reasonably good room and you don't, you don't want to choke the drums and you've got a good sounding tom-tom then just being an inch or two further away can make all the difference and give you that much bigger sound. Um, the thing with the 414s that I prefer over the 57s and 41s is that they're just, mainly it's just they're a bit brighter uh, so it stops you having to wind in a lot of treble and it's, they're already kind of pre-EQ'd almost so as long as you put all the pads in um, you get a nice big round bottom end and you get all that nice clear, clear sort of transient on the actual hit um, so they're my weapon of choice usually and it, I find then I don't very often bother with the underneath mics because you get all the weight from these uh, so that's how I tend to mic the tom-toms. So around, now around this side of the kit, um, there's a, a few different things that I've been doing around here as well. So the, the hi-hat, I've got my, I think I mentioned before, I like my thin silvery mics. And I previously was using a 451, um, but I do much prefer the KM184, which I've got uh, a pair of, which is the Neumann mic, um, which is their replacement from the KM84 and um, they're, they're sometimes criticised on certain websites for being too bright because they put in a treble boost compared to the original KM84 but I really don't have a problem with that and uh, I, I sort of took the plunge and purchased the pair after I think we'd interviewed Dave Chang who mentioned that he got some as well and he thought they were great and I've, I absolutely love them, they're, they're brilliant mics um, so they've got a nice sort of crispy kind of sound to them whereas I found the 451 a bit too bright and thin um, so it gives you a nice kind of biscuity, crispy kind of thing. So I've got my dark hi-hats, um, so they're not too piercing and too deafening. Um, and I've also been experimenting with using the other KM184 on the snare drum here, um, which I've got here, which I won't have that far up, but I'll just pull it up so you can see it in the shot. Um, I've put the pop shield on because they, they do pick up a lot of low end. Um, so sometimes if they get a big wind blast, it'll just give you a big bonk. It won't damage the mic, but it'll, it'll just give you a bit of a bonk on the speakers. It might damage your speakers. So, so I sometimes put that on to sort of just protect it a bit. Um, so I've been experimenting with using that on the snare drum rather than the old traditional 57 um, on a few occasions. And it, it's like with the TomTom -tom mics, it just gives you a bit of extra brightness. Uh, the main problem with using one of these is that they're incredibly high output mics so you can easily overload the mic preamp that you're going into if you're not careful. Um, I've found that I can use, I've got a, a Thermionic Culture Nightingale which has got a, a lower gain setting. I mean if it didn't need the phantom power you could almost just plug it into a line input and then it would be plenty loud enough. <laughs> so, so they really have got an enormous output so you just have to be a little bit careful about that. The other danger of course is that they're not as directional as a 57. So you've got to be a little bit careful if you have got a splashy hi-hat person or somebody doing lots of different things around and about and depending on how the kit's arranged you might want to get it quite close in which obviously is going to make it even louder on the output so there's a few things to juggle with it um, and I mentioned previously about trying to shield off the snare mic from the hi-hat and that's really just a matter of getting, this is a bit of foam from uh, a microphone case that I bought uh, from a mic so um, and what I'd do is probably put it something like that and put a bit of masking tape around so that it's picking up less of the, the hi-hat into the, directly into the capsule, it just kind of deadens off some of the high frequencies. And sometimes just doing that will just give you a little bit of extra separation from the hi-hat to stop you getting all that pss, 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 especially when you start trying to brighten it up in the mix and make it sound good, you sort of sometimes run into trouble. So I think that's a, I think it was a Michael Jackson record, there was a feature in a magazine some years ago where they said they'd done that on Thriller I think or something. So, so that's quite a good trick, and I do often do that these days now, uh, just to sort of ward off the extraneous hi-hats. Um, what else have I got here on my snare drum? Let's go to the, uh, yeah, meanwhile back on the uh, overheads. 
I think we mentioned previously about measuring them, so I can just quickly show you um, what I would do in this instance. Um, and it's really, the idea is to get phase coherence with the snare drum, so that if you're picking up any measure of snare on the overhead mics, which especially you would do if you've got 40 38, um, you want the phase coherence, you want them to be equal distance. So it's really just a matter of getting the tape measure and touching one end of it on one overhead and taking it to the middle of the snare drum as near as you can, like that, like so, and then you swing it around and say, so that one's a bit too close actually. Um, and it, they might look like they're sort of strangely arranged, but to get a sort of convincing stereo image, it doesn't really matter as long as you're, I mean, it's mainly going to be miking up the cymbals on this side. So I'd probably just move this one back a bit, like so, and then measure again and see if we're in the ballpark. And you, once you've done it a few times, you, I sometimes don't bother with the tape measure because you can kind of get a good, good idea that you're pretty close. And that, that's still, still too close, so, you know, probably move it that way or something, just to get the, the distance right. Um, and that, that does make a bit of a difference. You can get, there you go, that's, that's pretty good. So then you're going to get a nice solid snare drum sound in the middle of the image. Um, assuming the gains are fairly even on the uh, on the overhead mics, and that's something you might want to juggle with as well in terms of how close they are to the cymbals, how much ride cymbal you want. Um, so it might take a bit of adjusting and a bit of dashing backwards and forwards and fiddling about. Uh, but it's certainly worth spending the time doing that, and obviously checking the phase between the snare drum and the overheads. You find sometimes that they want to be reversed around the other way, so that you get the most weight of the snare drum. Um, and I've got on the on the snare itself. As you can see, there's some uh, moon gel going on here. This is what this is what a pot of moon gel comes as. You get f four bits of that in a in a pot, um, and that that's good for sort of just damping the, the snare a little bit and taking some of the ring out of it. This is my trusty Black Beauty, uh, as mentioned previously, and it, it sounds great when I sort of tune it pretty much as low as it will go without the lugs rattling. Uh, it's got a Weather King coated ambassador on at the moment, so. Um, I think my next purchase will probably be the ones that uh, Romesh re recommended the Emperor X heads as being a good one to try, so I think I might try that next time. Um, but at the moment I just try and tune, tune it down as low as it goes most of the time and you get that kind of nice, nice weight to it when it's... Um, I'll refrain from hitting it too loud and overloading your mic, but uh, you can hear it's pretty low. Um, and a couple of, couple of bits of moon gel just take the ring off a little bit. It's obviously important to adjust the springs underneath correctly so that they're not too tight or too loose against the, the bottom head. Uh, and then you can get into tuning the bottom head and all sorts of possible fiddling you can do. Um, with the tom-toms while we're here as well, um, you know, a common thing when somebody turns up with a drum kit is the toms might sound a bit like this. Now if you can hear that, these two are almost the same pitch, <laughs> so, so and then that one's quite a bit deeper. I always try and get them sort of evenly spaced, so I'm no great expert at drum tuning, but in this situation I'd probably get on this one and tune it down a bit maybe, and just try and uh, take a bit of the pitch out of it, so that there's a bit more of an even spread between the, the toms. Anyway, that wasn't, that's not exactly perfect, but uh, with a bit of fiddling, I probably maybe need to take that one up rather than taking that one down. But, uh, you know, if we sort of experiment with that kind of thing. Um, and of course, there's all sorts of gizmos and gadgets. There's an iPhone uh, app that Rob Toulson's done called iDrum, which I have not yet really checked out properly. That's, that's something worth exploring, I should think. Uh, and you can get all sorts of tension meters and things if you want to get scientific about it. So also while we're around here, I'll uh, have a look at the bass drum a little bit. You can see uh, there's, a, there's a ring inside it, which is a, a dampening ring, which is a useful way of sort of dampening the, the front head a little bit, uh, or the back head, I should say. Um, so that's, that's something to explore. But also you can see I've got a towel inside there. Uh, I haven't put my brick in yet, but I've got a couple of bricks on top of the fridge, and I'll, I'll usually stick one of those in to stop that moving about and just kind of give it a bit of earthing. To, to keep it from wandering around. Um, and then you'll notice also I've got a, a bass drum pedal here that's got some different surfaces on each side. So depending on how much smack you want, you can see that's got a, a shiny wooden surface. You can twist it around and have a, a more felty one, or you can use the plastic. So um, if you want extra smack, then that's kind of the... That's the setting to use. Um, so that's kind of how I mic up drums these days.
So you might think that uh, these mics I've got on the floor would be supplanted with some extra ambient miking around the room, but in fact these are plenty enough ambients really for recording in here usually. Uh, so because they're picking up reflected sound from the floor, although they're relatively close to the drum kit, they actually sound very ambient, and especially when you compress them a lot, that makes them even more sort of roomy sounding. So, um, so I tend not to bother putting mics further away much these days, but maybe come back in three years and I'll probably be doing that. Who knows? Ha, ha, ha.